Well, here's a question for you. If you could have any superhero power, what power would it be? It sounds like a conversation they would have on that show, The Big Bang Theory or something, right? But chances are, at some time in your life, you thought about things like that. You know, when you were a kid, you thought about what it would be like to have powers like superhuman strength or the ability to fly, or what it would be like to have a secret identity, you know, like Clark Kent or Peter Parker, what it might be like to wear a costume with a big symbol on the chest or, or a cool mask. What it would be like to have your own headquarters or base, you know, like the Bat Cave or the Fortress of Solitude. And, you know, the funny thing is, I mean, kids today, they can sort of virtually experience that with Xbox and Wii and PlayStation. I mean, I had a bath towel and a clothespin, and that was about as high tech as playing superhero got was fashioning, you know, my own cape. But I think there's something in us that wants to be a hero, something that, that, is inside of us that that makes us want to do something heroic, that that makes us long to live heroically. You know, maybe you still feel that way sometimes. Maybe not. Maybe life has beat you down a little bit. Life has a way of doing that, doesn't it? And you stop thinking about things like that, at least the way you did when you were a kid. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Joshua chapter 2. This morning, we want to talk about someone who was a hero. Someone who did something heroic. Someone who learned to live heroically. Her name is Rahab. We're going to learn a lot about her this morning and hopefully take and apply to our lives some very important lessons from hers. Joshua chapter 2. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll dive into our text. Father, thank you again for this opportunity to gather together with like-minded people to gather together to worship, to pray, to listen attentively to your voice as you would speak to us through this time of Bible study. Lord, you've brought each person here and you have something in mind that you're wanting to do in each of us. We invite you to do that. We welcome your work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, first we want to talk about letting go of the past. Let's look at verse 1. It says, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. Now, this is a whole generation after the Exodus. If you haven't read the book, you've seen the movie. You've seen the Ten Commandments, or you've seen the Prince of Egypt, or more recently, the Christian Bale film, Exodus, Gods and Kings. None of these movies may be perfectly, entirely accurate, but they give you the general idea. As we begin reading here in Joshua chapter 2, Joshua has succeeded Moses. They've crossed the river, and they're ready now to conquer the land that God had promised to them. Notice the place name. I'd like to make a couple of observations before we really continue with the narrative. The place name is of interest. It says Acacia Grove. If it sounds familiar, it should. Had we begun reading at the beginning in Genesis and read all the way through to Joshua, you might remember that Acacia Grove was the place where the men of Israel were seduced by the women of Moab. It's all part of the Balaam story that you can read on your own this week if you want to. It begins in Numbers chapter 22. But as a result of their sin, 24,000 people died. And it's just a reminder how the choices of one generation can affect the next. It's a reminder of how choices that our parents made affected us. And, and even how choices that we might make would affect, you know, our children or, or even our grandchildren. You know, I think of my family history where my dad was an alcoholic. I suppose he would say he's a recovering alcoholic, but he's been sober for years and I'm proud of him and happy for him. And his dad, my grandfather, was an alcoholic. He, uh, passed away some years ago and my dad had gone up to Stockton where he lived to go through his personal belongings he found he found a box and keep in mind that that my grandfather on my dad's side was a man that I could count on one hand the number of times I saw in in my entire life I mean he was that uninvolved in our lives 
But when my dad was going through his belongings, he found a little box. You know how lots of people, maybe you have a box at home where you've got keepsakes in it. It could be an old class ring. It could be a, a photograph that you treasure. It could be an award that you won. But there are things that are special to you, things that you want to remember. So he found a box like that. In that box, he found the marriage certificate from the first time he married my grandmother and the second time. He'd, he'd married my grandmother. They'd been divorced. They'd been remarried, and they'd been divorced again. He had the marriage certificates. And in there, he found one of my school pictures. That blew me away to hear that because here was this man that I saw and spoke to so few times in my entire life. I had no reason to think that he ever even thought about me. And yet here in his box of treasures was, was a picture of me, you know, as an elementary school student, as a boy. I couldn't help but think when my dad told me about this box that Whereas for most of us, it would be a box of memories. For my grandfather, it was a box of regrets. It was a box that reminded him of everything he had lost. A box that reminded him of what his addiction to alcohol had cost him. You'd think that my dad would have learned from that, but I remember when I was 12 years old, my dad taking me for a drive and, and telling me that he was leaving my mom and me and my sister and that I was going to have to be the man of the house going forward because he wasn't going to be there. It turns out he'd found another woman. He was going to leave us for another woman. My parents ended up getting through that particular rough patch, although they did divorce later soon after I uh, had left home. But how history tends to repeat itself. Maybe you too have a family history of addiction or adultery or abandonment or abuse, you know, the kinds of things that have factored into our stories in our families of origin, but we have the opportunity to do what these guys did. They came to Acacia Grove. They knew what happened a generation before. They knew how it impacted their lives, and they said, not this time. This is where it stops, drawing a line in the sand, and there's before and there's after. This is going to be different. We're going to replace all those bad memories with good ones. I love that. Another example of that, we'll notice in verse 1 that there's two spies. Now, that not, might not seem like a real significant thing on its face, but I think it is, and I'd like to take just a moment to explain why. A generation before, Moses sent 12 spies. Ten of the spies came back with a negative report and convinced everyone that they couldn't take the land, dooming an entire generation to wander and die in the wilderness. Only two of them had a positive report. One of those, by the way, was, was Joshua. So it's almost like Joshua says, well, I'm not going to send the 10 negative guys. I'm just going to send the two positive ones. But maybe more importantly, it underscores, you know, how negativity can destroy. How that negative report did, in fact, doom a whole generation. And I wonder how negativity has impacted you. I wonder how even negative self-talk has impacted you. But you think about the people around you, whether it's your family or whether it's your friends or whether it's your spouse, the people who, you know, they want to tell you what you can become and what you can do. And, and, and sometimes if you listen to the people around you who are sending the wrong message, you'll start to believe the wrong things. You know, there's only one person whose voice we really ultimately need to listen to and to believe. And that's the voice of our dad in heaven who tells us that, you know, he's got an awesome future for us and that we can be and we can do the things that he's called us to be and to do. So it's kind of like they said when they decided to send the spies in, not this time. It's not going to be like it was before. We're not going to handle this the way the last generation did. We're going to replace the bad memories with good ones. Well, those observations aside, back to the verse in our text, the spies were sent in to gather intelligence, especially it says in Jericho. Now, you know, the city of Jericho, you can actually visit their website. They have an official city of Jericho website on the internet. And it says there that Jericho is the oldest city in the world. So that's what they claim for themselves. Ancient Jericho, the Jericho that we read about was heavily fortified as most ancient cities were with a wall, but it had not one wall, it had two walls, and uh, it, it was because it was growing. You know how a lot of times um, 
You know, a city is growing until it runs out of space. Well, that would kind of happen back then. They'd build a city and they'd build a wall around it. But what happens when the population exceeded that? That's what happened in Jericho. So they had to build a second wall. So you had a suburb that was kind of in this ring between the two walls. And that will factor into our story. But we see that these guys, they went to the red light district. We're introduced to this harlot, to this prostitute, Rahab. So we go from talking about the oldest city in the world to what is sometimes called the oldest profession in the world. Now, before you get images of like the news and Lamar Odom and all the kinds of crazy things that we've read about this sort of escapade, understand that what was happening here was completely different. There's nothing in the text to indicate that, that they were there doing anything that was immoral. They didn't go to get under the covers. They went because they were undercover. You know, they weren't wanting to draw attention to themselves. And so they wanted to be seen and perceived as doing the things and going to the places that anyone entering the city would do. Now we meet this harlot named Rahab. And I love that it tells us what she did for a living. It speaks of the authenticity of the Bible. You know, if, if a bunch of people conspired together to create a, a religious book, as some people think the Bible, you know, that's how the Bible came about. Maybe you have friends or family members that say that, that, you know, it's just written by men. It's the ideas of men and that sort of a thing. If you and I conspired together to create a book like this, some kind of a supposed sacred text, we would certainly put our heroes, our heroines in the very best light, wouldn't we? The Bible never seeks to do that. The Bible presents people the way they really are. And that gives me hope. And it should give you hope to know that even with, you know, our failures and fallings and shortcomings and inadequacies and all of that, that that God still has a plan for us. And it's interesting to me that, well, so often in church culture, you know, we shame people and we shush people and we shun people whose stories make us feel uncomfortable or whose life experiences don't fit in, in the neat little box of how we understand things should be or, or how things should work, when the Bible doesn't do that at all. When the Bible lays it out there the way it really is. It makes me think that maybe our church culture would be healthier if we were open and honest about our life experiences and, and about where we are and where we're going and, and all of those kinds of things. Well, in fairness to Rahab, she may very well have done what she did as a matter of survival. We can't spend a lot of time developing it um, because there's a lot that could be said about it. But in ancient times, it was very difficult to survive by yourself as a woman. I mean, in modern times, we have issues of, you know, equal pay and so forth. You know, those are valid issues and things that, that we talk about and that we're concerned about today. We've come a long way, not that we don't still have a long way to go. But boy, in the ancient world, I mean, it was even harder. It was even more brutal. If you were someone who, if you were a woman who had never married or a woman who'd been widowed, and if you didn't have family to take care of you, you know, you were pretty much destitute. And so she may have been driven by desperation uh, in this direction. Hard to say for sure, but just throwing that out there. Could Rahab live heroically? Not unless she let go of the past. Not unless you let go of the past. And maybe this is what's standing between you and living heroically is that, that you perhaps haven't let go of the past. In Rahab's case, there might have been guilt from her past. Let's talk about that. Think about all the guys, all the hookups. She could have felt guilty. Do you have a past? Are there skeletons in your closet? You know, we've all done things that we're ashamed of. We've all done things that we're embarrassed by. We've all done things that we feel guilty about. But one of the biggest mistakes that we can make in life is when we allow our past to control our future. And you know why guilt from our past controls our future? Well, it's because we don't get forgiveness. I don't mean that as followers of Christ, we haven't received it. We have. I mean that we don't get it. We don't fully grasp it. You see, guilt says, I owe you. And when we feel guilty, it's because we have this sense that we owe God, you know? But the fact is that when I get forgiveness, I realize that I don't owe God because Jesus paid my debt. 
I'll always have this sense of gratitude. I'll, I'll always feel as if I owe God my all. I don't mean that, but I mean in, in terms of, of the specific debt incurred by my sins, past, present, and future. Jesus paid for those on the cross. And when I placed my faith in him as my forgiver and, and as the leader of my life, you know, all of those sins were forgiven. That debt has been paid. I need to get that. I need to understand that. I need to, to somehow get hold of that in my life. Now, the funny thing is, is that, you know, we are so focused on the past. We're focused on our own past. We're focused on others' past. And yet God is focused on the future. The Bible says with regard to our past that God forgives and forgets. Now, you won't find the verse in exactly those words, but the concept is there. For example, where it talks about God dropping our, our sins into the sea, you know, the idea that they're being dropped into the depth, some, some forgotten, forsaken, irrecoverable place. I love that. And I can't help but wonder if there wouldn't ever be a time that God would say to you or to me, I'm over it, why aren't you? I've forgiven you, now it's time to move on. Have you allowed a handful of guilty memories to control your life? To define you? to tell you who you are. See, just like we've talked about in this message already, you have the opportunity to say, not this time, not anymore, drawing a line on the, the timeline of my life. And, and it's not going to be that way going forward. I'm going to begin replacing those bad memories with good ones. Well, not only might she have been held back by guilt from her past, but also hurt from her past. I think, this is a little bit speculative, but humor me, go with me here for a minute. I think that she'd had a falling out with her family. See, in verse 13, we learn that she had a family, which kind of throws a wrinkle in what I said before about, well, maybe she was a prostitute because it was a matter of life and death. Maybe, maybe it was a matter of survival. I said that women without family might find themselves in that position of having to make those kinds of decisions. But she had a family. So something was wrong. Something was broken, I think, in terms of her relationship with them. You know, why wouldn't they have been helping her? Why wouldn't they have been taking care of her? Have you been hurt? Do you have hurt in your heart and in your life? Maybe, maybe even from members of your family? Is there resentment? Is there anger inside? We've all been hurt. You know why hurt from our past controls our future? Because we don't give forgiveness. See, if guilt says, I owe you, hurt says, you owe me. And there are some of us who are living with that sense of, you know, you owe me. You did this to me, or you did that to me, and you owe me for those things. You owe me to be miserable for the rest of your life. You know, there's that sense of calling in this, this debt. Maybe you have that feeling. And there's a saying that's so true, which is that hurt people hurt people. If I'm hurt, a lot of times I may respond to that by trying to hurt back. And one of the ways that we try to hurt the people who have hurt us is to withhold forgiveness. Well, I'll show you, you know, I won't forgive you. And the funny thing is, is that while we're laying in bed at night, rehearsing in our mind what we would say if we saw them, what we would do if we were in such and such a situation again, you know, how we'd stick it to them if we had the chance. We're sleepless having these thoughts and they're in bed sleeping like a baby. They don't even, don't even know or they don't even care. And we're not even punishing them. We're only hurting ourselves. When I give forgiveness, it ends any control the other person has over my life. You know, certainly we've, we've had to understand these things in our own lives. Miranda having, um, you know, been in a marriage that, that was characterized by domestic violence. And, and for me, having been in a, in a marriage that ended in abandonment, my ex leaving me and our then 17-year-old daughter, our lives were completely and forever changed by actions that we had very little control over. But it wouldn't help either one of us to live with unforgiveness in our hearts. You know, when we forgive someone, it doesn't mean that we're saying that what they did wasn't wrong. It doesn't mean that we're saying that what they did didn't hurt. It doesn't mean that what they did is okay. It just means that we're letting go of this sense that they owe us. It's a gift we give ourselves. So keep in mind that while it takes two people to reconcile, 
And I'll be honest, even though some people maybe won't like hearing this, the truth is that reconciliation isn't always possible and maybe sometimes isn't always even desirable. For example, sometimes it's not safe. But while it takes two people to reconcile, it only takes one person to forgive. And you and I can forgive today. We can let go of that sense that someone owes us right here and right now. If you allowed a handful of hurtful memories to control your life, to define you, to tell you who you are, once again, you can say, not this time. Now I'm going to replace bad with good. Well, so the idea here is to let go of the past, to let go of it. Do you want to live heroically? One of, one of perhaps only a few things that are standing between you and me and heroic living is our holding on to the past, so let go. Our experiences are real, but you and I, were more than those experiences. Now, there might be somebody here that says, I'm just not ready. I'm not ready to let go of my guilt. I'm not ready to let go of my hurt. Okay, I hear you. Let's get out the smartphone. You've got a calendar, right? You can set an alarm. So when do you think you'll be ready? This time next year? Maybe create an alarm for this time next year. 2017. Maybe five years from now? Ten years from now? Want to create an alarm for 2026? Program that in, set it to ring. That sounds silly, right? And it is a little bit silly. But it's not half as silly as letting the past ruin your future. So, to live heroically, let go of the past. Here's the second thing of three that that might have stood in the way for Rahab, that might stand in the way for you and me of living heroically. That is that we've got to face our fears. So let's go back to the text. We're going to pick it up in verse two. It was told the king of Jericho saying, behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab saying, bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house. For they have come to search out all the country. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut when it was dark that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan, to the fords. And as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. So these guys, they had been followed. Could Rahab live heroically? Well, not unless she faced her fears. Let's talk about fear. Fear is this universal thing. If you've never seen it, you might get a laugh out of checking out the website, phobialist.com. There are over 500 phobias cataloged on that website. I mean, you're scared of stuff you hadn't even thought of yet. As soon as you see the list, you'll have new things to be afraid of. Anybody here afraid of crowds? No? Yeah? Yeah? I mean, that's a pretty common thing, which is why I chose it as an example. Anybody here afraid of heights? That's a pretty common thing, too. Um, Anybody here afraid of needles? Some people terrified by needles. Anybody here afraid to raise their hand in public? Is that kind of a a thing? Yeah, see? (laughs) It is. Well, the funny thing is, you know, so I've got an adult daughter, Lauren, um, so proud of her. She's the children's ministry director at Calvary Chapel, Tallahassee. Her husband, Sean, is the associate pastor there to the senior pastor, Kent Nottingham. When Lauren was a little girl, she was so scared of people in costumes. And I remember that <clears throat> I have this picture. I haven't seen it in a little while, but I have this picture of Lauren at one of her birthday parties when she was, you know, a lot smaller, a lot littler, obviously. Why she wanted this, I have no idea, but she chose to celebrate her birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese, which is not the best idea for a child who's afraid of people in costumes, because there's that point in the party where one of the employees puts on the Chuck E. Cheese costume and, you know, comes sauntering out to see the kids. And so this picture is taken at the moment when Chuck E. Cheese is walking toward the table. Lauren has like jumped up in my arms, so I'm holding her. Her eyes bigger than the pizzas on the table. I mean, they're, they're huge, these ginormous eyes. She was so scared. So again, fear is this universal thing. You know, whether it's Lauren's fear of people in costumes or my crippling fear of a coffee shortage, we've, we've all got these things that, you know, are difficult for us. What are you afraid of? Fear is a powerful emotion, isn't it? 
mean, you can think about it like this. Fear will keep you from doing things you would normally do. That's how powerful it is. Fear is so powerful that it will cause you to do things that you, wouldn't, that you normally wouldn't do. And maybe that's why the most frequent command in the Bible, did you know this? The most oft-repeated command in the Bible. Think of all the commands you could think of. Which one is used the most? Do not be afraid. Appears more than any other. If guilt and hurt are from the past, fear is usually of the future. But there's this relationship because what I've discovered and what you may have discovered too is that in life you either make peace with the past or you fear the future. If you haven't let go of the past, that's going to actually fear, uh, fuel fears that you have about future things. Now, Rahab, she had every reason to be afraid. I mean, she was about to literally risk her life by hiding the spies and by lying for them. Now, wait a minute. Lying for them? This raises an ethical issue, doesn't it? Now, if I was smart, I probably wouldn't discuss this ethical issue because odds are pretty good that no matter what position I take, someone, maybe half of you will disagree with me. But you guys seem friendly. (laughs) And I'll bet you we can agree to disagree. So let me just touch on it briefly, because I think there could be someone who thinks, gosh, I don't know where to file this. I don't know what to think about this. So we're just, we're just talking about this like two friends would talk about it over coffee at Starbucks. See, we're back to coffee already. Talk about it like that. As followers of Christ, we believe in moral absolutes, right? We, we, we read the Bible, and we see that there are things we are specifically told to do, and we see that there are specifically things that we're told not to do. Absolute moral obligations. But you don't have to live very long in this earth before you realize that from time to time, two absolute obligations come into conflict with each other where it is going to be impossible to do both. And so you're going to have to do this one and not that one or that one and not this one. So regardless of what position you take, you're going to leave one of those moral obligations unfulfilled. And so the idea that some Christian ethicists have is that You should choose the greater of the two and that there's no guilt, there's no sin in doing so. In other words, that she chose life-saving over truth-telling rather than choosing truth-telling over life-saving. And I think she did the right thing. Again, we can agree to disagree about that totally 100%, but I will throw this out there for your thought. Knowing that I would lie to save your life you probably feel pretty good about hanging out with me. If somebody, if there's a home invasion and you're in the bathroom and they say, is there anyone else here? I'm going to say no. That should make you feel pretty good about hanging out with me. Now, on the other hand, if you're not good with that, I'm a little bit freaked out about hanging out with you because I know you don't have my back. Yeah, he's raising up. There's a guy in the bathroom right now. Why don't you get him? (laughs) Something to chew on. Have you ever played it safe only to regret it later? Remember that time that you struck out looking? Oh, what you'd give to go back and take a cut at that pitch. Remember that time you knew the answer, but you didn't raise your hand. You didn't speak up. Remember that time that you wanted to volunteer. You were this close to signing up, but you didn't. What about that time that you couldn't decide in the house or the car and someone else got it? Or that time that you almost told someone how you felt about them, but you chickened out. You didn't. You said nothing. Rahab could have played it safe. Rahab could have refused to hide the spies. She could have refused to lie for the spies. Instead, she risked the life she had, the only life she knew for the life that she wanted. That's big, and we're going to come back to it. To live heroically, you have to be willing to risk your life as it is. And maybe this would give us if not a different way of understanding, maybe an additional way of understanding what Jesus meant when he said these words as recorded in Luke 17, verse 33. Whoever seeks his life will lose it and whoever loses his life will preserve it. Now that's the New King James Version. It's a version I prefer that I read out of and teach from. But listen to it just for a little bit of illumination. Listen to it from the New Living Translation. Whoever clings to this life will lose it And whoever loses this life will save it. Maybe an additional layer of meaning there. Now listen to this in the message. If you grasp and cling to life on your terms, you'll lose it. But if you let that life go, you'll get life on God's terms. 
That's good. I like that. You know, when it comes to risk tolerance, some of us see ourselves as risk takers and others of us don't. Some people would say that they have no tolerance for risk at all. Is there anybody here that you'd say, yeah, I'm a risk taker. I am. I, I take risks in certain ways. I, I would say that about myself. So that's not, that wasn't a trick question. I, I would say that I have been many ways in my life been a risk taker. Um, and that can be a good thing. But there's also a lot of us that just aren't comfortable with that. Is there anybody that would say, yeah, typically, honestly, I have a pretty low risk tolerance. Anybody like that? Lower risk tolerance? Yeah. The thing is, is if you try to tell me that you are like a no risk tolerance person, I'm going to question that. I'm going to debate that. I was in a bookstore one time. Remember those places with shelves and books that were like hard copies? They used to have lots of those. And I saw this book. Here's the title. The 100 Most Dangerous Things in Everyday Life and What You Can Do About Them. Do not read that book. I mean, it'll totally freak you out. I did not know until I read this book. And did you know that every year in the United States, more people are killed by teddy bears than by grizzly bears? It's true. There's relatively few deaths by grizzly bear, but there are choking accidents and things that sadly and tragically happen with teddy bears. Did you know that every year in the United States, over 4,000 people, um, you know, actually experience injuries from their television set? I mean, you know, this can happen, for example, if the TV is on top of a dresser and gets pulled over. It could be like a, you know, a, a crushing type of an injury. Did you know? That every year in the United States, 60,000 people are injured by the toilet. No kidding. So don't tell me that you are a no-risk person unless you're prepared to hold it forever. (laughs) And then maybe you can make the case. So much for risk-free. Here's the deal. The question is not whether you're going to risk Everyone takes, takes risks. The question is what you're going to risk. What I want to encourage you to do today is to see yourself as a risk taker. But listen, this is, this is the crux of the risk thing. Will you risk the life you have for the life you want? Living heroically this life that God has for you. Or are you going to risk the life you want? living heroically the life that God has for you to hold on to the life that you have now. I remember reading one time that there are lots and lots of pilots who go down with their planes simply because they prefer the familiarity of the cockpit to the unknown of ejecting and parachuting and and all of that. And I wonder how many of us in our own lives are putting at risk this heroic, amazing life that God has for us because it just feels so much safer to just let things be, to just go with the way things are. So the idea is to face your fears. What are you afraid of? What would you do tomorrow if you weren't afraid? If you're the kind of person that marks in your Bible, you could circle the fear words in verse 9, terror and faint-hearted. And you could underline the fear phrases in verse 11, our hearts melted and neither did there remain any courage. And then in the margin, you could write these two cross references, Hebrews 11, verse 31 and James 2, verse 25, because there it talks about Rahab's faith. You know, she probably felt fear and you and I are going to feel fear, but we don't have to be controlled by it. The opposite of fear is faith, which brings us to our final point. To live heroically, we've got to let go of the past. We've got to face our fears. And finally, we've got to believe. Let's begin reading again in verse 8. Now, before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites when you were on the other side of the Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house 
and give me a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. So notice what she had heard in verse 10. She'd heard about the Red Sea crossing. She'd heard about the kings defeated. Notice what she said in verse 11. She refers to one God. The word translated God there is singular and not plural. People around her believed in in a plurality of gods. She refers to a personal God. Notice it says your God. The gods that others in Jericho worshipped were impersonal gods. Notice that she refers to this all-powerful, everywhere present, at once God when she says in heaven above and on earth beneath. In other words, I'm suggesting that Rahab had come to believe. And so picking it up in verse 14, it says, So the men answered her, Our lives for yours, if none of you tell this business of ours. And it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall. And she said to them, Get to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Afterward, you may go your way. So the men said to her, we will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your own home. So it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be in his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from your oath, which you made us swear. Then she said, according to your words, so be it. And she sent them away and they departed. And she bound the scarlet cord in the window. Now notice it says she lived on the wall twice in verse 15. So remember, We talked about the double walls. So this is the exterior wall. You know, she's in the suburb, as it were. Her place is there on the wall. Now, archaeologists have, have, you know, done their work there. And they tell us that if we were approaching the city and looking at that outer wall, what we would see would be a 15-foot retaining wall and then a 25-foot brick wall. So we're talking about a drop of like 40 feet. Now, my question is, what was Rahab doing with a 40 to 50 foot rope? You know, I mean, how many people just keep a 40 or 50 foot rope laying around? My guess is these guys were not the first to make a hasty escape from Rahab's place. I'll let you think about that. But she was not going to let these guys go until they had a deal. Here's my question. Why in the world didn't she go with them? Wouldn't you have just gone with them? The advice that she gave, she could have done it with them. She could have led them to a cave in the hill country of Judah. Then when it was safe, she could have followed them to Acacia Grove. I mean, think about it. What if they didn't return? What if they returned but didn't keep the deal? What if before they came back with the intentions of keeping the deal, she was found out? There's only one reason why she didn't go with them. And that's verses 13 and 18, these references to her family. Yeah, the family that we think she was likely estranged from. Could Rahab live heroically? Not unless she believed. Not unless she believed in God. Not unless she believed in herself, by which I mean what God was doing in her life. And not unless she believed in the future, in this future that God had for her. But not just hers. Theirs too. She had so many reasons not to care about anyone's future but her own. She'd been overlooked by the eligible bachelors of Jericho. She'd been used by immoral men from far and wide. She'd apparently been abandoned by her family. Who would blame Rahab for wanting to get out and for never, ever looking back? But that isn't what she did. The idea here is believing God for a big future that makes us and others bigger. If your dream is so small that there's only room for you, that's not, that's not God's dream for you. But if your dream about the future is so big that there's room for you and for others, if it makes you and others bigger, then that's God's dream for your life. The case in point, well, if we continued reading, which of course we won't do, by the time we got to Joshua chapter 6, we would find out that When they came and conquered Jericho, that just as promised, she and the members of her family were saved 
Joshua 6, verse 23. Joshua 6, verse 25 says that at the time the book of Joshua was written, she dwells in Israel to this day because of what she had done. And perhaps even more impactful is that when we get to the New Testament and we turn to the very first page, the very first chapter, some of the earliest verses of the gospel, we see that in the family tree of Jesus, we find this woman, Rahab. This is amazing. She becomes a descendant, or I should say, her, she has as a descendant, Jesus himself, the Savior of the world, which some see symbolized in that scarlet cord in verse 21. Rahab, she goes from, from being a prostitute to being a beloved mother. She could look back in her life and she could say that there were chapters that she would love to rewrite if she could, just like I do have chapters I'd love to rewrite, just like you likely have chapters that you'd love to, re to rewrite. But the truth is that, that at this moment, being willing to let go of the past, being willing to face her fears, being willing to believe God, not just for herself, but for others, none of that mattered anymore. She could live a heroic life that, that we would be talking about all these years later. Will you do those three things? Will you make sure by, by letting go of the past and facing your fears and by believing that nothing stands in the way of you living the heroic life that God has for you? I'm going to say a word of prayer and ask Miranda to join me back up in the stage. We'll do a closing song and then turn it back over to Pastor Reuben. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for this time of Bible study. We're grateful, Lord, that we have the story of Rahab. And, and Lord, that as we read it and study it together, we can learn and grow and be challenged to, to do some of, the, some of the things that she did that changed everything. Lord, may, may there be some change that comes to our lives as a result of our time together here today. Amen. Offer this heart of 